Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Anne. Oui. Hello, I'm Anne Laure and I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this uh, fourth session. So I'm sorry to have to repeat the introduction, but um, as we welcome new people each time, I'm going to have to um, repeat this um, text that brings us together today. So we have entered the Anthropocene. We are Anthropocene. We are the earthly community. We are living together. The climate change, ocean acidification, sea level rise, species extinction, pandemics, famines, soil pollution, spread of fires, migration, floods, droughts, generalized urbanization, and social inequalities. The list is infinite. We no longer control our effects. Everything around us is shifting. And whether we like it or not, we are newly exploring our own lives and environments. From our close environments, our daily practices, our lives, what do we want to express? What is offending our moral conscience and our sense of injustice? What makes us angry or happy? What are our ideas and intentions to change the situation? Do we feel like earthlings? Today, let us speak up, give our word, and engage in dialogue. So we are working on the fourth session. As I will explain, we are now together. It's, uh, eight, it's 6 p.m., and we hope that ev we have organized things so that every time zone can uh, meet up at 6 p.m. So even if many of you are here from all over the world, I would particularly like to welcome some a dozen or so countries that I would like to mention. So Turkey, Antarctica, Madagascar, Kenya, Haiti from Paris, Iraq, Russia, Kuwait, Qatar, Somalia, Iran and Uganda. So we have different people. I don't know how many people are online. Well, I've, let, I've dropped everything, so sorry. So before we start to talk, why are we doing this experiment today? So we all want to take a stance. We all want to make a testimony to what Anthropocene means. Despite our distances, our differences in age or origin, I think in this group we are very different. We all live on the same planet, and I think it's important that a common manifesto can be given form. So, I think what we are experiencing today is a start of a story where we can start a conversation that's necessary between people and the start, perhaps, of a network. So I'm impatient to find out how what comes out of this fourth session. Just a little rule. Some of you are already uh, familiar with uh, the way we work, because obviously we're still uh, we're lunchtime in France. So we have a coordinator here, François. Pinto, who will be who will be putting the different uh, internet users uh, into contact with each other. We also have Lorette, who is our uh, cartoonist, because we want to express in drawings these messages. And I would also like to thank the work of our interpreters who are working with us and who will translate all our everything that we have to say. And that reminds me that we have to speak slowly and please remember that you are being translated. <laughs> so we're going to have three phases. First, we're going to look at some videos. And then we have uh, people who are going to uh, speak to us. And then the coordinator will give us the order of um, each speaker. See you later. Hello. I'm sending you my warm salutations from the 
Antarctic Station Concordia. My name is Davide Tossolini, and I'm speaking on behalf of the crew winter over C-17, which is passing winter here in complete isolation for nine months. We are in the last continent discovered by humans one of the most inhospitable places on Earth, Antarctica. What you see here is the Antarctic Plateau. In this direction, there's the South Pole, and our neighbors are in that direction. They're about 700 kilometers away. They're Russians of the Vostok station, another scientific base. Beneath our feet there are three kilometers of ice around us. There are no living beings. The only living beings, beings on the plateau, us and the bacteria we brought with us. Over the winter here we can reach minus 80 degrees Celsius. The moment we're at about minus 30, 35. We're at now in the summer, and the sun never sets. During the winter, we have three months of night. Our world is a finite place, but this will be always be a frontier. Here, only scientists and a few other people set foot in a very precarious way. We're here. We're following the instinct of Ulysses. We want to find out more and understand our limits. The Antarctica belongs to no one, belongs to no nation. All scientists and everyone who is here must reach, must follow the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic is a continent desi designed for Pacific use, for scientific goals, free research. In the whole continent, the use of atomic energy is forbidden. Here we s select all our waste. We pack and send them away from the continent to recycle them. We are constantly f finding the limit, the maximum limit to our impact on nature. Here we have uh, solar panels to produce the energy during the summer. And all our efforts are targeted to reduce our impact on this isolated territory. The place we are here is very important to study the climate evolution of our planet Earth. Behind me is the tent of the international project EPICA. This project consists in uh, perforating the whole ice crust of the Antarctic Plateau for about 30, for 30 kilometers deep. And we bring out, we extract cores um, from which, and we extract gas present in these little bubbles. And from there we are able to understand how the atmosphere has changed, how the different gases um, have a different concentration during, over the past 800,000 years. We have un therefore understood that in this last period, for the last centuries, the presence of CO2 has increased considerably. A few miles in that direction, there is Epica 2.0, which we called Beyond Epica. We will try to reach a depth and even deeper. We will try to go even deeper. That means at least 1 million to 1.3 two million years ago to try and understand what how what the atmosphere consists of. Underdeveloped countries most affected by the climate crisis Les pays sous-développés qui sont les plus euh, affectés euh, par la, la crise environnementale sont ceux qui ont l'empreinte carbone la moins, euh, la moins forte. Et les pays développés, eux, rejettent énormément de carbone dans l'atmosphère. Et lorsque les pays développés créent la... Euh, 
la, la, le, le changement climatique, eh bien, ce sont les pays en développement qui en souffrent. Il faut trouver plus de justice là-dedans. So what offends our moral conscience and sense of justice? I think it's with respect to our conscience of living together, living together on this planet, our, in respect to the centuries, the thousands of years of what we have learned so we are, in a way, we are condemned to live together in this inevitability of living together in a limited space. We have to have this moral conscience and this sense of justice. So what offends that? It's everything that could go against what I believe is common sense, everything that goes against, the, everything that uh, contributes to our mutual destruction. So what are the solutions to change our situation? We have knowledge which enlightens us and which al would allow us to make the right decisions, decisions that would promote our personal happiness, which will not have a negative impact on the collective well-being. Personally, I feel I am an earthling, but more than that, if I had to say yes or no, I would say yes, but much more, much more than that. Great. Well, thank you for these three videos, They're all very different, very personal uh, testimonies that, um, and we will also hear from Madagascar later. So we've got four people with us, people from Madagascar, Kenya, Haiti and Turkey. So before we open the mic to everyone, to we open up to everyone, there are two people who have not done a video, so I'd like to give them the opportunity to talk and tell us about what you want to say today, just in a couple of minutes, with respect to this Anthropocene manifesto. So I'd like to talk to Evelyn in Kenya. Can you hear us? And Stephanie and uh, Mackenzie to open their videos. Can you look? Can you please open your cameras so at least we get the impression that we're together? Is that possible? Delighted to meet you. It'd be nice to see your faces. Can Evelyn from Kenya, are you with us? Can you hear us, Evelyn? I can see her. Yeah. Hello. I'll let you talk, uh, Evelyn. I don't know if you have seen the other sessions or watched the videos, but do you have a message to give us, to give to all the different countries? We're we listening to you. Kindly translate, because I can't hear. Ah, je, elle n'a pas comprend. I, can, can, you, can you hear me, Evelyn? You must, I think, uh, on your Zoom, you have to open your translation feature. On your screen, can you please open the translation? Evelyn. Evelyn, we're going to send you a message so that you can open the, trans the translation. So we're going to go to see Mackenzie in the meantime after we have explained to Evelyn how to open the translation. Hello, Mackenzie from Haiti. So you're a writer. You come from Haiti. <clears throat> what message do you want to put across? And how do you react to everything you have heard? 
Well, the question of the environment is a question that's quite uh, extensive. In Haiti, for example, but as we're on talking on the global level, it's very difficult to grasp. There are some countries that have environmental problems that are linked to politics, which is not adapted to people's lives, also linked to education issues. We don't know how to do things. And with and we have bad we have adopted bad routines. In Haiti environmental problems are becoming real threats. For some people it's just a problem like any other. And one of the problems of Haiti is very complex. And we have to try and find a solution. There is um, a deforestation that is caused by farming. That's a problem that is fundamental because people who work on the land need to destroy acres of forest and create and make charcoal which they're going to sell to um, for the subsistence of their families but also farming we, we have a problem of the population density which requires a a good educational and common policy. So it's a very important question because we live in a world where we are have to live together. And I think it's important to look at these um, questions, the, the, uh, the life of our family, the life of others, regardless of the family, regardless of the culture, regardless of politics, and regardless of the approach. I believe that this approach is necessary as long as it takes into consideration others. It means going towards the earth, life, animals, biodiversity, with lots of respect and uh, clarity. Well, thank you for that uh, testimony, which uh, means that we need to be aware of how other people live. So before I start to uh, I start the discussion, I'll try and get back to uh, Evelyn. Evelyn, can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you. So do you have a personal message? Is there something that makes you angry? Something that you want to share with us? Yeah, sure. Um, I can share with you. I'm from Kenya, in the third largest city called Kisumu. And basically what I'd like to explain is that uh, Kisumu was established in 1900 as a transport hub and a trading post. And upon independence, the city has grown from 19 uh, uh, kilometers square to the current 417 kilometers square. That gives you an indication of urbanization. The city has been growing. And with that urbanization, as much as uh, it has its good side, the flip side of it is that uh, there's a lot of uh, development, increase in density, and many people are now uh, building in ecological sensitive areas. And we have uh, in Kisumu, for example, we have three island areas that surround the city. So the city somehow falls in a valley and uh, it has the second largest freshwater lake in the world, and that is Lake Victoria. So with a lot of developments on the highlands and the hills, we have a very um, rapid uh, erosion, uh, stormwater 
uh, stormwater runoff, and we find that there's a lot of development and there's no uh, water seeping down into the ground when it has drained. So then uh, we experience a lot of uh, runoff and erosion, and the road networks don't have proper drainage channels. So we find a lot of siltation and um, eutrophication into the lake. We find the algae has grown into the lake. This is affecting the ecosystem in the lake as well. So these are some of the challenges that we are experiencing with the um, uh, rapid urbanization and climate change, the changes in uh, rainfall. So for me, what I'd like to see is that there is change in policy to protect the highly sensitive areas like the hills and the mountains so that people do not develop on top of them. And we ensure that we continue to plant trees so that we don't have a serious erosion uh, that is uh, eventually finding itself into the lake and causing uh, a lot of flooding, urban flooding in the informal settlement, a lot of siltation into the lake, and as a, as a result, we find chemicals into the lake and causing uh, a lot of growth of algae that is affecting the lake ecosystem as well. So that is my message uh, to you today. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, vous nous... Thank you so much for your contribution. You've just explained live from Kenya numerous signs that show how our overall balance is affected and you're calling for political change with new, with a new set of actions. Now we're going to see another uh, video. I'm sorry I uh, just said that I'll give the floor to Denise, but just before, I'd like to give the floor to Stephanie in um, Madagascar. And she will tell us about the association she works for for uh, whales. And maybe there's a, a message that you'd like to get across concerning humpback whales. Hello there, can you hear me? Oh, great. So I'm in charge of communications uh, for the association called Sitamada, based in St. Mary, for the conservation of um, sea mammals. So what, you, uh, what we need to know is that Madagascar has an incredible uh, variety of um, richness in terms of animals, fauna and flora, so we need to protect uh, the nature. So that's why we've created Sitamada. This year, 50,000, um, well, over the last years, 50, more than 50,000 humpback whales have been hunted. And thanks to our conservation effort, efforts, they are now uh, considered as endangered, uh, as an endangered species. And so in the Indian Oceans, Indian Ocean, we've inaugurated a sanctuary in 1979 with Seychelles Islands, and it's been active since 1986, and it's a space where uh, whales are protected. And so now they're in good shape, and so that's a message of hope. Uh, thanks. This has been carried out, and, and uh, this uh, was made possible thanks to the conservation and the association. And we know that uh, there are interactions between uh, whales and the environment. So we are focusing on sustainable development by engaging local populations in um, this uh, for, for, the, for this to, for this cause. And so we're, thanks to participative science, and by implementing a charter, um, a sustainable charter of observation, this will allow people to observe whales and dolphins. And we came up with, came up with guides in order for people to observe the uh, um, rules 
that were set. And so the local, local populations can also uh, then educate tourists at that respect in order for them to discover why we protect whales. And of course, whales is the biggest animal on Earth, and they're an indicator of the health status of the Earth. And we know that if they're in good shape, the rest of the planet is in a rather good shape. And so whale, whales represent 1,500 trees because they can absorb three, uh, 33 tons of CO2 per year. So it's, uh, they play a huge role in the regulation of the climate because uh, because their excrements uh, stock and uh, concentrate nitrogen. And whales are a powerful economic engine. So a living whale is worth more than a dead whale. And so they represent $10 million per year. Uh, the, the, um, hunting whales uh, represents $10 million per year, whereas observing whales represents $1.2 billion a year because of tourism and everything that um, is consequent to this. And it's an umbrella spe species because if we protect whales, we protect other species. So uh, to wrap it up uh, with Setamada, we uh, improve um, the, um, the, the habitat of whales, but we also improve where um, human beings live around whales. And 80% of our waste come from um, the earth and our land and then end up in the ocean. So this is something that we also raise awareness on. And so we've also created a health center for local populations in St. Mary in order to reduce the pressure on the marine habitat and the sea habitat. And so we do work in collaboration with local communities. And so the, our message is that thanks to the observation of, of humpback whales, we are really proud and observers and the local populations are really proud and also tourists then become really proud of the conservation work that they carry out. Well, thank you very much for your testimony um, on preserving wild animals and wildlife and especially humpback whales. Thank you so much. And before getting in to the debate, maybe we can uh, then welcome Denis Cheviskis, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. I think it's important, and we've already um, had um, representatives or, let's say, ambassadors of the youth. So you've talked about justice in your video. Do you have a more personal message that you'd like to um, get across or something else that you'd like to share live about the importance of, of nature? Up to you, Chavez. Can you hear me, Dennis? Hello, I'm Denis from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm 13 years old. I have been skipping school on Fridays and striking for the climate for the past 97 weeks. So, I want to tell a few words as a climate striker. We are in the Anthropocene epoch. As you know, this term is used to describe the recent period in Earth's history. This is the period when human activity started to affect the climate significantly. For a few generations, our elders have already shaped our future, and this future sucks. Actually, we are not Excuse me, could you please slow down so that we can interpret what you're saying? Because we really want to understand what you have to say. This is why we are raising our voices. This is why we are pushing everyone to act for climate. 
And this is why we strike for climate. We are trying to explain how urgent the situation is. We, activists, do not share our own findings and views. We want scientists to be heard and scientific reports to be taken into account. What we are saying is, listen to the scientists. Our time is running out. It is no longer enough to turn off the lamp in the next room or to recycle the papers. More is needed to turn the world from the brink of extinction. We want as many people as possible to realize the danger that awaits us. The danger that awaits Generation Z and all future generations. Yes, climate crisis is affecting the whole world, but especially the most innocent ones. Never forget that while developed countries create the climate crisis, the undeveloped ones and animals and children suffer the consequences. Always remember the injustice in this. Always remember that we need to change this. To change this, we need activism. We need action. This is why the World Anthropocene Manifesto is important. If every climate activist, everyone initiates change in their own country, the whole world will change. So we need millions of climate strikers and activists. The climate government has a goal, and that is to save the planet. If we can achieve our goal, then we can have a future and a life we deserve. But this will only happen if we can manage to mobilize governments against the climate crisis. I hope we can achieve this. I hope our efforts are not wasted. On behalf of every creature living on Earth, and thanks to everyone who takes action for the climate. Thank you. Merci à vous pour ce, ce message. Thanks for this message. We heard in the previous session we talked about uh, uh, islands resistance. We can see that there's a militant uh, challenge ahead of us. Et les, and the, the small gestures are not enough. We really need to have spokespeople. And you tell us that the manifesto could be a, a good uh, starting point. So what do you personally think, what do you expect from this uh, world manifesto? And the ability to discuss with other countries in the world on this issue, to listen to their stories and their testimonies, what could be, how can we progress from this point? How can we work together? We actually want a future that we can live uh, as we deserve. Uh, that's why we, uh, Generation Z is trying to do, to save our own future. And to do that, we need to achieve uh, zero carbon emissions uh, in order to stop the climate crisis that will affect the whole world. I'd like to see with other people, um, Alfonso, are there other people on the chat who want to talk? Are there, is, does anyone else like to react to what has been said in this session? <laughs> or even yourself. I would invite our guests to uh, ask other questions. I think that's the principle of this manifesto, to put people in contact together. I don't know if Dennis, for example, wants to ask Stephanie something or vice versa. Uh, you would be welcome. Yeah, I think that Denise Mackenzie from Haiti, I think Denise is right to say thank you for your words. Acting to protect our environment means changing our habits and our old practices. It's a real serious thing that's going on, and we need the commitment and, and investment of everyone. And sometimes the day-to-day -day problems may hide things, but we need to find to think about our future. So, yeah, it is possible. Are there other reactions? Evelyn, are you there, for example? So, you, um, 
Eh uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, bah, si Evelyne est là, est-ce que... Well, if, do you, Evelyn, uh, do you have something to ask to our other citizens who are talking here, who say that we need to act together? What is the connection that we're trying to build today? What's the... What's... Is it something that you think is good for you? Do you think it can support you? I, I think the lady who uh, presented from Madagascar, the presentation was very informative. Uh, the value of uh, whales came out so so well that this is information that I didn't have. And looking at uh, we want to sink carbon, I think whale was coming out as one of the very important uh, creatures on earth that we need to preserve and we make sure that we protect it. Uh, it has um, much more value uh, and uh, it's also supporting the, the climate change fight. So as much as we are planting trees in areas that we don't have water, I think in areas that we have large water bodies with the, the whales, I think it is important that we also protect them. So that was a, an important message that I took home from the discussion. So, if I hear you, one of the potential virtues of these contributions, of this sharing throughout the world is to uh, enrich our awareness and to uh, support actions. How about the emotion? I get the feeling that, this, that since this morning that there are a lot of people who are working, who are motivated. I, I, I hear your anger, all sorts of emotions, and sharing them perhaps uh, puts us in a momentum for action. Um, how about in your daily lives, in your relative, re relevant countries, are there any actions you want to talk about or any um, hope uh, that occurs to you? For example, uh, well, I, or anyone who wants to talk, Mackenzie, Evelyn, can you give any examples in your countries that can that has struck that a, a particular sign that at your level in your country that could be interesting to share with us? For example, we had the humpback. Well, I was not aware of that either. Are there other sorts of um, niches? How about in Turkey? Something is happening that you would like to share? Je ne vous vois plus. Can't see you. Well, w waiting for uh, Denise's uh, answer. I would just like to react to these contributions uh, so that we uh, stay on track. I just wanted to highlight the relationship that is being created between local and global. So we have the test an example which is very local, which is Stephanie's example with the humpback whales. We also have the testimony of Denise, who reminds us of what is happening on all over the globe. As a geographer, I am very interested in this relationship uh, on and the different levels. As, as a personal level, I, I really started to become aware of uh, climate change and the deterioration of the environment. When I moved to Paris, I came from a large city in Italy, in Sicily, Palermo, which was considered to be uh, polluted because there is a, a lot of cars, there's no factories. But I had never personally felt pollution myself. But when I arrived in Paris, which has a very high degree of pollution, for the first time in my life, apart from everything that you can hear and listen about uh, environmental issues, it was the first time I personally effect, uh, felt it, my body felt it. So what I would like to uh, ask the, our guests, has, has there been a, something which affected you in your daily lives? 
that you felt even in your own body that may have made you aware of the problems. I hope you understand. Was there a sort of trigger that um, participated in your awareness and maybe a change in practical attitude that you could share with us? For example, I would like to know for De uh, from Dennis, what, how did she how did she experience her first strike when she decided not to go to school and to do something for her future? Because obviously she's very, very young. Dennis, can you answer that? Uh, I actually started uh, my first uh, strikes at my school uh, after the first global strike. And But when I first uh, started striking outside and on streets, uh, I was using a placard that only said uh, school strike for climate and uh, in Turkish. But uh, people who didn't uh, fully know uh, what climate crisis is uh, couldn't make sense of that placard. So I felt the need to uh, prepare another placard. And my new placard said, uh, are you aware of the climate crisis? I can tell you if you want. And uh, this placard actually worked really well. Uh, people started uh, coming next to me uh, and asking questions. And I was uh, telling them about the climate crisis. And it was like a really good feeling for me because I uh, saw that I was uh, creating some awareness and uh, people were ready to take action because uh, the reason people were, weren't taking action is that they aren't aware of the climate crisis. When I told them about climate crisis, they were like, um, okay, so what can we do? And I thought that I was uh, doing something good to change in the future and save uh, my future, my own future. So this was uh, how my uh, first climate strike uh, started. And uh, I have been now uh, school striking for climate for uh, 96 weeks. And I'm not going to stop until uh, we can't uh, save our future and say change some things. <laughs> well, we adore your determination. And we thank you for this de determination. And I think it affects everyone. I think at the age of 13, uh, a world strike uh, affects you personally and makes you want to act is fantastic. And the fact that you see that you have an impact on other people is what motivates you. Can we ask the same question to Mackenzie? Mackenzie? As a writer or as a citizen? Was there a trigger that made you want to uh, talk today? What made you aware of this issue? We can't hear you, Mackenzie. Are you there? So, I don't know if I'm really demonstrating, but I do carry in myself all these... Um, words, He's I would say all this anger because I come from a, a, a country that has been weakened, a vulnerable country, but it's not the only country to be at the heart of these issues. When it Especially in Haiti, it's a country which is in a constant state of emergency, political, social, even language emergency. It's a country that does not talk to itself. This is a very important uh, issue. How can you um, demonstrate, how can you protect human life if the people who belong to the same country don't even manage to talk to each other? 
a large share of the population speaks Creole and a minority speaks French. So these two populations don't talk to each other, don't understand each other. So there are attempts at awareness. But generations differ. We're not in the same generations of the 60s, people who experienced the Duvalier uh, politicians, people who have experienced the American um, presence, but this is a new generation which has a social awareness. The country is completely deforested. P people are sad. And obviously, the ecosystem of the country is becoming more vulnerable because, as I said earlier, there is such terrible poverty. They People are forced to destroy their environment just to survive. So awareness is a, a huge up struggle upstream. You have to go into the classrooms. You have to explain to children. You have to show what's happening. And they have to understand how to talk to a tree, how to protect their environment, to protect themselves. And in reality, today, we see the emergence of another uh, type of uh, action. We have uh, associations who have a, an advocacy that is slightly different, which have, so there are people who would talk a lot about, uh, who would make propos proposals, but it stays, but it's only, stay, it's only an ecological stance without any practical implementation, without creating a gateway, a sustainable gateway. So that's where we are in Haiti, in a sort of uh, very hazy situation between an ecological uh, position and concrete action, which would work to the future. So the, ten the earthquake of January 2010 has destroyed all actions that had been set up until that t date. An environmental pragmatism that did exist. So we are very vulnerable. We are also the garbage bin of many countries. As you know, the Caribbean um, throws their waste out and it ends up with us. We are also politically vulnerable. Other people choose our governments. So the local vision, the national vision does not count because other people impose their policies and their ways of doing things. So it's a real chaos. And all this weakens certain actions and ideas. We don't know how to start. We don't know which way we're going. And when I look at Haiti, I see a, a virgin country, the, a blank canvas that has not been built. And if we don't reach a consensus, a solidarity, we need. We do need to build this country. Sorry, I was too long. No, it, we really feel that it's heartfelt and it really is very exciting. We've only got five minutes left, so I'd like to continue. So, as well as environmental education, there's the question of dialogue. 
between countries. You wanted to talk? Uh, no. Uh, before we finish this session, I just wanted to say a couple of words on the first video that we saw on the Antarctica, which was in Italian, and which you can find uh, the translation you can find on our YouTube uh, channel. I was really happy, as well as uh, the countries that Michel had assigned to me. Um, well, I was really, I decided to extend this session to territories that are not really standardized, that uh, go beyond the notion of uh, nation state. So there's Antarctica, which is not really a country, it's a continent, which as Tonini says, that it belongs to nothing. There is a Arct Antarctica Treaty, it's in a space of free research which has uh, which there are a lot of um, restrictions regarding uh, the environment as he said himself in the video the only place that he was we re he was almost in the south pole the only living thing is them are themselves and the bacteria they brought and today we look at this, uh, the activity of this Franco-Italian cent center, the Epica center, which involves digging a core into three kilometers of ice. And we are going to extract uh, these cores from, uh, and we're going to analyze uh, ice bubbles. We want to try to identify the composition um, the composition of the Earth between 800,000 and a million years ago. So to know our planet and to quantify this Anthropocene, it's, this is absolutely vital. And we look at this continent, which is absolutely inhabitable habitable for humans, apart from scientists who have the necessary uh, uh, infrastructure, which you can imagine is quite restrictive. You can imagine that already we already have uh, traces of this Anthropocene on this virgin uh, territory. In the core, we can see that over the past hundred cent century, we see the effects of human impact. So we can see that there's an impact on the composition of the hu of the atmosphere. So I would like to thank these people because it's just a little logistic. In the moment, it's the summer in Arct in Antarctic. They have a sun 24 hours a day. And they did this little video, even though they're very committed to uh, shift changes. Soon the winter um, team will ar arrive for nine months over the winter. And despite that, I would really like to thank them for their commitment to our initiative. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I would really like to, their, their way of demonstrating is to explain what they're doing. When we see the different uh, testimonies, we see the importance of these different experiences, the fact that we actually are in the Anthropocene and the need to talk and to resist and have a conversation and uh, talk about it. As Denise was saying, it's the need to participate at each level in this uh, global awareness so that actions may expand and go further, so that small individual gestures may have an impact to uh, meet this emergency. What's very difficult, let me just react, uh, it's very difficult because as we saw in the last uh, sessions, there's a huge difference over the planet. There are people who already experience it in the first person. There are people who don't necessarily experience it, but who are worried about it. And that's probably a major difficulty is that difference between the different geographic realities, the way this change is perceived. There are places where which are disappearing, which already suffer, and there are places where it's going to happen. 
There are changes that we hope won't actually happen in the future. Well, thank you, Alfonso. I'd like to thank Stephanie, Mackenzie, Dennis, and Eve Evelyn for their contribution to this session number four. And we ask you to continue to listen to each people's testimonies, wherever you are, whatever age you are, whatever origin. Thank you all and hope to see you soon. I think it will be, I don't know what time, I think it's uh, two o'clock French time. So anyway, thank you very much.